A friend once asked me what I thought was an interesting question. Do I think we will ever willingly give up control of our lives to intelligent machines? I'll be honest, I thought the question was funny, because to me it seems so obvious that we already have. You're skeptical, I can see. Uh, and I won't speak for anyone else. If you just emerged from your cabin in the woods for the first time in the past 20 years, uh, I sincerely appreciate you coming to my talk. But I will speak for myself. Every day, I listen to music on Spotify. And I am recommended songs that subtly shift my music taste over time. I am friends with the people that Instagram suggests I be friends with. I shop on Amazon. And every day, I am recommended ads for products that I never knew I needed until I see them. When I'm going someplace new for the first time, I will trust Google Maps to tell me how to get there. And when I'm applying for a new job, I cross my fingers that their resume screening algorithm likes my word choice. In all of these cases, I am trusting huge parts of my life, huge parts of who I am, my tastes, my career, to the apps that I use. We all have cases where we have to use software that we don't totally understand. This raises the question, are the so is the software that we built doing what we want it to do? I think the past decade has answered with a resounding no. Consider scrolling through a social media app looking at photos and articles. That app will need to decide what post to show you next. And it may use machine learning to do this. But the whole point of this entire system is to show you the thing that you most want to see, the thing that will engage you the most. I think most users would be OK with this premise. The problem is, oftentimes, the stuff that engages us is the stuff that scares us, or makes us angry, or pushes us back into our own echo chambers. It's not just limited to social media. An innocent search for a school project may yield 9-11 uh, conspiracy videos. A new mother looking for parenting advice may find dangerous anti-vaxxer blogs. Why does this happen? As someone who has spent a bit of time interning and programming at larger tech companies, I can definitively say it's not because these companies want it to happen. In fact, the thing that struck me was the degree to which people care that the stuff they build actually benefits the people who use it. So if this is true, if companies don't want to radicalize or scare their users, which I hope is not a super hard sell, uh, then why does this still happen? Answering this question requires that we dive a little bit deeper into what machine learning and artificial intelligence actually are. So bear with me. When a programmer like myself sits down to write code, we normally do so deterministically. This is when you know the solution to a problem, and you can articulate what needs to happen at every step of the way. This is like sending an email. If you tell me who an email is to, what the subject line is, and what the contents of the email are, I can tell you exactly what the end user will see. The whole process is deterministic. This is the normal way of doing things. And it works great, but it requires us to know a lot about the problem we're trying to solve. And there are lots of problems that we don't have great solutions to. For example, how do we tell spam email apart from valid emails? Now, I think with these two emails, we can see pretty easily. Uh, one of them specifically tells me there's not a virus in it and asks for my social security number. Uh, and that is obviously spam. And the other one uh, is actually a recommendation for a coffee shop for my boyfriend. Now, I can look at these and immediately say one of these is spam and the other one isn't. But I can't tell you exactly what makes one spam and another not. And if I can't do that, then I can't sit down and write a perfect deterministic solution to this problem. Now, while I don't have that perfect deterministic solution, I do have plenty of examples of what spam email looks like. What machine learning allows us to do is to show a computer the kind of result we want it to reach. For example, I can say, when I show you emails like this one, tell me that they're spam. And then that computer, through a process that looks a lot like human learning, 
can figure its own way to get to that desired outcome. This is what we call machine learning. And it can be an incredibly powerful approach, but it's not without its downsides. An illustration that I think is really apt is the mythical trope of the genie. Now, the genie shows up in different stories, uh, different times, and can be quite different across different tellings. But there are normally two consistencies. First, the genie has this amazing power to grant wishes, to give you things that you couldn't get any other way. Second, if your wish has any ambiguity in it, the genie will find a way to fulfill that wish in a poetically awful manner. You may technically get what you asked for, but it is unlikely to be what you really wanted. Artificially intelligent machines can behave similarly. They have this amazing power to solve problems that we couldn't really solve any other way. But they also have this penchant for misinterpreting our requests. Now, AI and machine learning are not nefarious creatures that are trying to trick us, but like the genie, they have this way of showing us how little we understand our own desires. This highlights what I believe will be a central question humanity will have to answer over the next hundred years. How do we state what we want exactly and without any ambiguity? If we could do that, if we could develop a concrete idea of how we want the world to look, not a hand-wavy stump speech about right and wrong, but a detailed, precise understanding of what our morals are, then we could imagine building an AI and telling it, show us Instagram posts that we like, but don't violate our values. So this raises the question, what are our values? This is a question that we have been working on since the dawn of recorded history, uh, and actually well before that. Philosophers have given us plenty of great starting points to answer this question, but the problem is philosophy, our normal modes of philosophical inquiry, don't often lead us to consensus. Now, I still think we should be asking these questions. I think these questions of philosophical importance are really, really central questions. But if we want to constrain the actions of an AI, we need a detailed, concrete engineering spec of what our moral reasoning looks like. The problem is, for most of us, for me at least, when tasked with determining what the morally correct action is in some scenario, I have a I know it when I see it sort of approach. Now, if you've been paying attention, your brain might have just lit up. This I know it when I see it approach doesn't allow us to write the perfect deterministic definition of morality. But it is exactly what we need to apply machine learning to a problem. I am not saying that we should abdicate our moral responsibility to the artificial intelligent computers. But I do think machine learning and data science can be important tools to help better understand our own moral desires. That is what I have been working on. I have trained a artificial neural network on the most basic of moral tasks. Telling when someone is speaking with moral weight versus when they're just expressing a personal preference. So for example, when I say, I believe you should treat all human beings with respect and dignity, this reflects a belief that I hold, a moral belief. Now, on the other hand, if I say, I believe pineapple does belong on pizzas, this is more of a personal preference. A correct personal preference, but a personal preference nonetheless. As it turns out, after training my little AI on a number of example cases, it's pretty good at determining when someone is speaking with moral weight. Now, I could try to demonstrate this by reciting performance metrics like validation, accuracy, and recall, uh, but I won't do that. But what I will do is to try to show you what this AI has learned about certain words. We can do this by showing the network a word, seeing what neurons light up, and then comparing that configuration of lit up neurons to known quantities like good and evil. Uh, for this exercise, I'm using a body of work called moral foundation theory that identifies different words they think represent moral ideas. 
So here we can see the dichotomy between care and harm. On it, we can see words associated with care are colored in blue, and words associated in harm are colored in red. The units here are unimportant. What is important is that this is where the AI is placing these ideas in a conceptual space. This is how it thinks about these ideas. And as we can see, it has developed a clear understanding of the difference between care and harm. Slightly differently, here we have uh, the dichotomy between fairness and cheating. Again, we can see a similar pattern. Now, I am not looking at this and saying, yep, we should hand the keys to the AI and go home. It's got it figured out. Uh, I'm not saying that, but I do think that this approach shows real promise. If we could collect enough data on how people express their moral reasoning, we could use this opportunity to apply machine learning and dive deeper into what our morals actually are. But it's not just about how much data we have. The type of data that we have is really, really important. In March of 2016, Microsoft launched a conversational chatbot on Twitter called Tay. Tay's job was to talk to other humans and to learn from those conversations to develop a better understanding of how to speak like a human. As soon as she was launched, she was immediately bombarded uh, by internet trolls sending her a bunch of uh, hateful, offensive, and inflammatory messages. And sure enough, Tay learned from them. Less than 16 hours after she was launched, Tay had to be shut down for offensive tweets like this one. Our machine learning is only as good as the data that we give it. But fundamentally, data is just a collection of measurements about the world. This means that it captures all the good in the world, but it also captures all the pain and hate and inequality in the world as well. Recently, we heard of a major tech company that used a resume screening algorithm uh, to go through and vet potential applicants to jobs. The algorithm's goal was to look at a resume and to be able to say whether or not that person was a competitive applicant for the job they were applying for. To train this algorithm, they gave it the resumes of all their current engineers. And this makes a lot of sense, because if your engineers are qualified, then their resumes reflect the kind of thing that you're looking for. The problem is, we currently have a huge gender imbalance in the tech world right now. There are way more men working as software engineers than there are women. This isn't an, something that anybody wants. Nobody likes that. But it's a fact in the world, and so the data reflect it. And sure enough, just like Tay, this resume screening algorithm learned from the data that it was given. It was noted that it rejected applicants for including words like women's in their resumes, as in women's basketball team. This highlights what I think is another shortcoming of machine learning. It is so good at understanding the world as it is, but it doesn't really have the ability to imagine the world as it could be. If we want to use this opportunity to apply machine learning to understand our morality better, then what we need is millions of people trying to express what that morality is. I firmly believe that if we want to constrain the actions of AI, the only way those constraints will be any good is if they're arrived at democratically. This means we all need to show up and talk about our values. It can be really easy to throw up your hands and say, the world is broken and everything is terrible. But I want us to take a moment to take a step back and to think about what the world would look like if it was less terrible and less broken. How would you even begin to describe that world? When offered a wish by the genie, how would you phrase your request?